Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Executive Insights Podcast. My name is Elliot Sloan with the McCallum Group. Today, we're very excited for our guest, Mr. Aaron Bloom, the CEO at DocMJ. Aaron, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. Hi, Elliot. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So tell us a little bit about your professional background and what led you to be one of the founders of DocMJ. Tell us uh, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Uh, my professional background and by education, I am an attorney and I was I practiced as a healthcare regulatory attorney. So when medical cannabis became legal through a constitutional amendment in Florida where I, where I lived and practiced, I got involved with it through my uh, regulatory background and ended up helping and working with Doc MJ, which is a um, medical marijuana physicians practice group, and helping them navigate many of the regulatory concerns. And, and really it was new, it was new territory. So we sort of had to figure it out as we, we went along and became more and more involved in the, the operations and ultimately was fortunate enough to become the CEO. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's certainly an emerging emerging industry. And I think a lot of states are starting to file in order to realize that this is such a great medical service that their uh, residents really need and deserve. Yeah, it is certainly a, a snowball effect and a trend that is just picking up speed. And, and as you as you said, it's because so many people are getting such incredible relief and benefits from this plant that it just is something that, that can't be stopped. And so many people are benefiting from it that it's growing exponentially in, in any, any state that that permits it. And the states that don't, I think, will soon. Yeah, the numbers and the results don't lie. Um, so the old days of reefer madness are just punted out the window. You can't even, you don't even have a claim to stand on that this is a dangerous substance. It, it, it's very interesting that you mentioned reefer madness because that's something we see over and over when it starts in a new state. You hear the same concerns. You know, what about kids? What about uh, people driving while high. What about it being a gateway drug? What about overdose? Every state um, has the same concerns, and we did in Florida as well. And you, you heard those concerns. And when we talk to people in Colorado, in, in California, in Washington State, who've been doing it now for decades, they just laugh at you and they say, you know, what makes you think that Floridians are going to be different than than the rest of the country? And so it's been going on long enough now, and we have enough data that none of those parade of horribles um, have come to pass anywhere. And so a lot of that falls away um, with education and with more experience and when more people see the benefits. And when people know somebody personally who's benefited from it, it changes their perspective um, entirely. Absolutely. And it's great that we are getting away from that stigma. Um, in my opinion, the marijuana plant just should be per perceived as a healing tool not a tool for um, creating chaos. That's right. And, and we need to continue to explore the many different ways. I think we've only just started to see the benefits and, and some are obvious and some are using now, um, but I think continued research um, and access to, to better and more research will unlock even, even more medicinal benefits. Sure. Tell me a little bit more about DocMJ. How does the business operate? How are you serving patients? So DocMJ is a, as a physician's practice. We have doctors in offices um, in Florida and in other states, and we see patients who want to qualify um, to be able to purchase medical cannabis legally through the medical program in their state. So in Florida, um, we, we connect the patient with the doctor. They come into our offices. There's an actual examination. We review their medical records, discuss whether or not they qualify under the state laws. And if they do, we can put them on the registry. Uh, qualify them, explain to them what strains may benefit from them, and help them on their journey um, through medical cannabis to help them with whatever the issues are, physical or emotional or mental, uh, that they're suffering from, and, and hopefully help them find the relief they're looking for. Sure, absolutely. It's a huge need. Now, um, are you partnering with other practices in any capacity to be able to deliver this service to their patient population? So we have a couple different uh, models. Primarily, the doctors are our physicians in our offices. And so there are patients and, and our doctors. Sure. Uh, we do have a, a customized electronic medical record system 
which is customized for the states that we're in. So it works perfectly and integrates with the state um, uh, website and the state registry. And so we do license that out to other practices and other physicians who want to become more efficient. We make sure they're they're legally compliant, that their charts and their records uh, tick all the boxes and, and meet all the requirements of, of the state uh, Department of Health. Sure. And so we do interface with other doctors that way. We can also help them with with marketing ideas and business ideas from what we've learned from, from doing it from the beginning. That's great. It sounds like you are open to helping everyone build this into their service lines. Uh, you're not necessarily trying to contain it under DocMJ, um, where it's only your brick and mortars. You really want to help everyone embrace medical marijuana in Florida. Yeah, absolutely. And we've helped a lot of doctors who are interested in it, sort of um, curious about it, how to get involved. Because, you know, doctors, regardless of how many years they've been practicing and, and what their specialty is, they don't teach us in med school. They don't they don't talk about this. You can't pick up a, a, a book and a medical book in med school and and look at dosages and, and look at you know recommendations on how to how to prescribe this for your patient. Sure. So doctors of all you know different backgrounds have questions about it. And so we take our experience and, and our you know, 45, 50 doctors and, and pair them up and are happy to have them shadow or learn from our doctors who've been doing it for, for a long time and, and seen thousands of patients. Yeah. Is there any special training or education that's required to be able to make these recommendations? Uh, in most states, there's not, and it really is a state by state requirement. Uh, in some states like Florida, there there is a course they have to take. It's a two hour course and it's it's candidly about the rules and regs. It's not about the medicine. So if they want to learn about the medicine, the doctors really have to be self-starters and, and self-educators and go out and seek uh, reliable sources to learn about the medicine and the science behind the plant. Got it. Now, talk to me about the challenges with running a business that is federally illegal, but considered legal state by state. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, everything is more difficult. Um Certainly finance, finding finance and funding um, and lenders is difficult. The, the traditional lenders and traditional finance organizations are not available to you. Um, even things as simple as is renting space. When you first go to a landlord and you want to rent a space for a doctor's office, they get very nervous. What are you doing? You know, are there going to be drugs there? Are people going to be high all the time? And so you have to get through some of some of those concerns. Simple things like opening up banking accounts and merchant processors are, are challenging because anybody who is federally insured or you know has, has any interstate commerce it is concerned uh, advertising is a challenge you know facebook doesn't doesn't like it um texting companies sometimes don't like it because you're texting about a, a federally illegal product over uh, federally regulated telephone lines um, insurance agents don't really know what to do with it it's it's difficult for some insurance companies to um, figure out what to charge in premiums and and how to um, calculate risk so yep. sometimes that's a challenge. And um, early on, we've, we've gotten over this hump in most states, but early on, uh, many physicians were concerned about their DEA license. You know, what's going to happen to me if, if the federal government finds out that I'm doing medical marijuana recommendations? And anytime you bump into any uh, organization or agency that is federally funded, so think about a nursing home where the patients would benefit, uh, the VA where, where you have a lot of, you know, veterans who are suffering from PTSD that, that benefit from it. Sure. They don't want to, they don't want to touch it, um, because they're concerned they might lose their funding or lose their ability to, to be, um, reimbursed by, by federal funds. So it touches just about every aspect of, of the, of the, of the industry. That's really unfortunate. The people who need it the most or the organizations and the agencies that have, uh, care over massive patient populations are just having to turn their head at this uh, game-changing solution for some of their patients. Yeah. Uh, another good example along the same lines is cancer patients. The, the, oh my gosh. The cancer, the cancer um, clinics and the cancer providers who, who do federal research and get federal funds um, are very concerned about, about touching it. But as we know, you know, cancer patients are, are one of the primary benefits. It, it really provides a lot of relief for people going through uh, cancer treatments. And, and most of the major cancer institutes um, are pretty opposed to it because they're concerned about losing federal research dollars and federal funding. It's insane. You know, they're putting so much harmful drugs into these cancer patients to try to battle the cancer with chemo treatments and radiation and heavy, heavy narcotics. 
but then you you know you run away from a natural substance that could provide a lot of relief it's just backwards any way you look at it yeah it provi- it provides a lot of of relief to the symptoms yeah without causing the negatives and it's an appetite stimulant which you know again for cancer patients is is a benefit sure well <clears throat> hopefully we can see um the shifts happening you know i, I like to believe that there's only so long the federal government can drag their feet on this matter. What are your thoughts on how long it's going to take for this to become nationally recognized as first medical marijuana and then maybe even recreational? Um, you know, that that's the, the billion dollar question is, is to when and what is the federal government going to do? There are a lot of steps between where we are today and, and legalizing it medically and recreationally. And I think we'll take we'll take small steps first. There are some. There's the Safe Banking Act, which allows um, banks to do business with companies that are operating legally under state laws. That would loosen uh, a lot of the financial issues. Um, I think they will hopefully first loosen some of the rules about research. You know, sort of admitting that hey, let's at least take a deep dive into this because at the moment it's very difficult to get funding for. Um, solid research programs, although they're done in other countries, um, it would be great to loosen that. I think that will come first. So I think, you know, clearly as more and more people are exposed to it by by the state legalization programs, it will sure. become a war uh, too loud for the federal government to ignore. But I do think that, um, and again, predicting what the federal government will do is, is, is pretty challenging. But given the gridlock, I think we'll take small steps first before we see any wholesale uh, legalization of, of cannabis. Sure. It'll it'll be rolled out nationally on a medical marijuana basis first. Um, and you think that could be something that we see in the next five years? Well, I think what f- happens first is we de- decriminalize it. Sure. So instead of instead of saying on the federal level, let's roll out a federal medical program, we decriminalize it, which loosens the, the financing, loosens all the banking, all of the advertising, and allows the state programs to really take off. Got and it. We let the states um explore it more and, and, and we get rid of some of the stigmas and, sure. and criminalization of it. I think that happens first and that happens, I hope relatively soon, just the scheduling it off of the, the schedule one drug. Yep. And then from there you could talk about when it becomes medical really needs more research to have solid data on exactly how to use this program for specific medical conditions. Sure. Talk to me about how, Big Pharma plays a role in this. Do you see them lobbying to slow down the process of bringing medical marijuana to the forefront because they don't want to lose the prescription drug business? Um, I don't know if they will openly lobby against it. Um, Some of them have dipped their toe in it, and some of them have made some pretty major investments in CBD uh, products uh, and in the CBD market. So I think what will happen is I think they will try to take it over. I, I yeah, think of course. Big Pharma. I think Big Pharma, instead of opposing it, I think they will try to write the rules in such a way that they can benefit from it and they can ultimately um, produce it on a mass national level. And you would buy it in your local drugstore like you do any of your pharmaceuticals today. I think that would be their ultimate long term. Sure. They stall it until they can get their hands wrapped around it and then they push for it to become nationally recognized. <laughs> it's not a bad, it's not a bad, bad case study. Sure. I mean, certainly um, somebody has to be looking at how do I do this on a on a national level and, and and create a brand that's trusted on a medical standpoint. And then the other big, the big component from a business standpoint is if and when insurance pays for it. Yeah. And that's a, a pretty significant game changer as well. When you could just go and get it for your $10 copay like you do your opioids. So uh, you talked to me about having some challenges with advertising Doc MJ on some social media platforms and some uh, issues with trying to do some SMS outreach. What has been your successful direct-to-consumer marketing initiatives to get your brand out there and to let patients know, hey, we're here, come in for a consult. We can help. Yeah, direct direct to consumer marketing for us is is a challenge because there's a lot of things that are that are um, not available. We've done just about everything, and I would say the most successful really is um, a strong SEO program, good, well written blogs that answer the questions that people ask 
um, when they're interested, when people are looking for an alternative medicine um, to help relieve some of their symptoms. So the SEO drive is, is, is probably been the strongest and most successful. We've tried traditional radio and television um, and print ads, and there's limited success with those because you're really looking for patients who both have a qualifying condition and a willingness to, um, to explore medical cannabis th through the legal process. So it's not um, it's a it's a relatively small market that you're looking for. So the SEO really drives you to people that are um, on their own um, looking for it, and they've initiated it. The real driver has been uh, referrals. So a patient comes to you, uh, has a good experience, is successful on the program, and finds relief. They tell everybody. They tell their friends. And when one of your friends, your colleagues, somebody that you know, like, and respect, says to you, "Hey, I couldn't sleep, get a good night's sleep. Now I'm sleeping really well," or Hey, I've replaced my two glasses of wine at the end of the day when you know when I put the kids to bed with this with this product, which has no calories and has no side effects. Um, that's when you say, "Hey, if it's working for for them, let me take a look at it. Where'd you go? Who who helps you? Hey, I met this really nice doctor who explained the process, explained the program, uh, told me where to go and what to purchase. That's really been the, the most successful driver uh, of patients to us. Sure, that makes sense. You have a lot of great brand ambassadors. Shouting from the rooftops, hey, you need to check out Doc MJ. Yeah, that's right. That's really that's really the the way um, that most people find us is through a referral from a friend or family. That's terrific. It speaks volume to the experience and uh, the service you're delivering. It, it's really it's really so important that, that people come and in and, and um, feel that they're cared about and cared for, and that we're here to really help relieve their suffering. Because most people come to us at a point in their life where they've tried everything else. Um, and nothing else is, is working and they've done all the traditional medicines and they're just looking for relief from their symptoms. And that's a tough spot to be. So if you can, if you can help them and you can relieve those symptoms in a way without the side effects, um, you're right. They do scream from the rooftops. Hey, everybody should be doing this. Sure. Talk to me about the culture at Doc MJ and how important is the culture for a medical organization? And what can leadership in the C-level executives do to make a difference? Yeah, yeah. Culture is everything. I, mean, I think culture is important in, in um, most industries, but I think even more so in ours. First of all, it's private pay. There's, there's no insurance. There, there's, no, um, there's nobody else funding this. So everybody's coming out of pocket. So you have consumers who expect and are entitled to good service and, and appropriate service, as opposed to maybe in your traditional healthcare where you know, you're lucky to get in with your doctor. So you sort of take the, 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 the care and treatment that they give you. You don't have a whole lot of options. Where here, they do have options and, and they are private pay. So you have to treat them. And like I said, the patients come to you, um, they're suffering. They're suffering physically. They're suffering emotionally. Uh, so you need to have a culture that says to these, to these patients, we, we're glad you're here. We care about you. And we want to make a difference in your life. And that's really so important that we um, have that culture in our corporate office, to our medical assistants in the office who sees the patients, and, and to our physicians. I'm very fortunate because in this industry, it tends to attract people who who believe in the product, who yeah. believe in the medicine. And so they sort of come to you with, I want to make a difference. I want to be part of something important. So that's really helpful. Um, you know, the, the question what can the C-suite do? You have to live it. You have to treat your employees like they matter to you. You have to care about them so they can care about the employees. Um, you have to give every answer. Every answer that people come to me with always is, well, what's best for the patient? Let's take care of the patient first, and then we worry about everything else. And I truly believe if we take care of our, our employees and we take care of our patients, the business will come, the, 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 the finances will take care of themselves. And so you really have to live that culture of caring about your staff. And as we've grown, what I've learned is you have to hire and promote people who embody that. And you have to, to take the people who don't embody that and they have to find a different industry. And so what that says to employees is, hey, we don't tolerate this behavior because if you tolerate people that are inconsistent with your culture, it, it sends a very poor and, and very mixed message um, to your staff. The other thing we do in our industry is we try to stay um, very professional. Like we are in the cannabis industry and, and we get that and what comes along with that. But we're running a medical practice and we're taking care of patients who are suffering. So there's not a lot of, of, of 
you know, celebration of getting high. There's not a lot of, you know, we're, we're in this to have a good time. We're in this to take care of our patients and we have a good time. We have a great culture, a great, great environment, but we stay hyper-focused on the fact that we are here to medically help our patients who are suffering from, from real ailments. And, and when you do that, um, it trickles down and we get such great feedback from our, from our patients. When you change a patient's life, it's just, it's just a really wonderful thing. And it really, it's a, it's a circle of, of, of the culture that comes back to you from the patients and the feedback we get from patients is just really um, terrific. The, the staff will tell you what they really enjoy is a patient's first return visit. They come in the first time, a little nervous. It's a little weird to walk into a doctor's office and say, hey, I'm here to get some you know, marijuana. When they come back the second time, they come back skipping, right? Like, oh, this has changed my world. Let me tell you how great it is. And one of the questions our doctors ask is, are you getting a benefit from it? And the answer is always yes. Um, and they they love to to tell tell the story, and that helps. And we try to take those stories and filter them through the organization so everybody understands the real life impact we're having on our patients' lives. Yeah, you're changing lives, and I love what you said earlier, which is um, you know people come to your organization because they want to be part of a movement, right? They they want to be part of something that is greater than them, and be uh, able to say you know they were in the early ground floor of bringing medical marijuana to the mass markets. Um, there's a lot of options as far as getting into the healthcare space, but this is definitely a specific type of calling for serving patients. Um, and I agree a thousand percent also with what you said, which is keeping a level of professionalism. The industry is going to carry a stigma of it's a bunch of stoners, right? Trying to find legal ways to get products out, but it's so uh, incorrect stigma. And I think that organizations like yours have to set the bar even higher than a regular medical practice. You have to be even more buttoned up than your typical family medicine doctor's office or um, you know, general practitioner that people are seeing on an ongoing basis. And I do believe that a medical practice is really a customer service business that happens to be in the medical industry. What is your thoughts on that philosophy that really you are a customer service business? Well, I think that's I think that's accurate. Yes, we certainly are a customer service industry. The 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 medicine at this point is treating symptoms. So right. the patient is really in the best position to tell us if it's working. If, if you come in because you're unable to sleep due to anxiety, stress, depression, uh, if you're suffering from PTSD, you come, we help you find the right strain and the right products for you at the right time of day. And if it's if it alleviates that um, symptom, you know, your chronic pain, then it's worked for you. So from a medical standpoint, it's really helping people understand how it works and helping them find the right strain for them. So that really is building a trust and a relationship and a communication much more so than a, a, a technical medical um, diagnosis at this point. They come to us with the diagnosis. They come and say to us, here's what I'm suffering from. Will medical cannabis help uh, help me? And if so, what kind? So it certainly is a, a medical practice that is designed to help patients find the relief they're they're looking for. And so in that sense, certainly it, it's a customer service um, and, and, and help them navigate the system. It, sure. is, it is fairly complicated to go from, hey, I want to purchase medical cannabis legally and actually doing it. it it's expensive. It, it's complicated. And so you, you create the customer service to explain and, and walk the patient through. And in Florida and other states, we have a lot of elderly patients and, and some of the, the online issues and some of the, the those things are, are challenging for them. So we have a really caring staff who enjoys spending the time with the patients and helping them get from, you know, how do I get relief to thank you, I'm getting relief. And it's it's really rewarding. Yeah, I, I believe it. I believe it. And I'm sure um, you have all different walks of life that you're treating with medical marijuana. There's no typical patient profile. We, we just recently ran, because we hadn't done it in a long time, um, mm -hmm. a report and analyzed our own patient sort of base. And what's so interesting is it is very evenly divided between male, female, and even the age groups. When we break it up by by 10-year segments, you're, you know, 50% or below 40 and 50% or above 40. Um, it's, it's, it's a very well split up, um, diverse group of people. It's not just one group. And it's certainly not young people 
um, doing it just to get high. That's not who our patient base is. That's not who's coming in and, and going through the process. Um, it, it's truly people seeking relief for, for true medical um, ailments. Sure. Talk to me about the competition in Florida and the other states you operate in. How many options do people have when they decide this is something they want to look into? Um, you know, with a lot of medical practices, people really are in the driver's seat. They have tons of options available. They're going to do research. And that's kind of what I was getting at earlier, where medical practices are a customer service business because it's it's now um, there's a lot of providers in your um in your area. So whoever is going to provide the best experience is typically where people would like to go. Um, and I would imagine that's how the medical marijuana space is trending toward. Yeah, I think like any new industry, you know, and it starts out new in every state, right? So um, you have you have sort of new over and over again, where, where, whatever state you're in and where they are. And they all start out the same. They start out small. They start out with just a few providers who are willing willing to do it. And then as more people get more comfortable, you get more and more providers who are willing to provide this service in more and more competition. And just like any industry, you get the um, much more expensive you know, doctors who will spend a lot longer with you and a lot more handholding. And you get the much less expensive that are really just come in quick, get out. And, and the patients have to find um, that right balance that works for them. And some patients that I know what I want, I know what I need, I just want the cheapest doctor I can find. You can search for that and you can find that. Others who I really want a more of a high level concierge service, you can find that as well. And then there's everything in between. So there's a lot of competition um, and a lot of variations of, of how doctors present themselves and what kind of patients they they appeal to. So it, it's a evolving market and you have to find your place in it and, and stake your claim. And, um, you know, for us, we were here first. Um, we went out big and strong and created a really good base and we have a very strong retention. So our patients come back to us. We don't, we don't tend to lose a lot of patients, um, to, to our competitors and during things like, uh, there, there's a lot of changes in the rules. And so you have to be able to, to adapt to the rules as the regulatory scheme evolves. And then, you know, COVID, you know, cause, cause changes and, and, and there's all kinds of different variances that, that happen in the marketplace. And if you're able to adapt, um, you, you know, you do okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the process for patients. Once they become one of your patients, how often are they interacting with you? Well, it depends on what state you're in. In Florida, they're required to come back to the doctor every seven months. Got it. Uh, other states, Ohio is a year. Some other states, it's up to the doctor how often they want to bring them back. So it's really state dependent. Got it. And then the other interaction is in between. If they have questions or, or issues, they can, they can call and, and contact us. And what we typically find is most patients early on in the process, like anything, they have questions. How do I get on the registry? You know, where do I go? What do I buy? This is what happened to me. What do I try? So you get a lot of questions in the beginning. And then like, again, in, in most new things, after a while, you find what works for you and, and there's there's less need to interact um, until they come back for their, their follow-up. Sure. The um, level of care really depends on the patient. It's probably a wide spectrum. That's right. We, we, people ask, you know, how long is an appointment? And really the, the right answer is as long as it needs to be. Sure. And some are, some are very short. You walk in, you know what you need, you know, you're an educated consumer or, or you're, you're familiar with the product. Um, it's a short visit. If, if you have questions, you have issues or you're, you're newer to it or more nervous, some appointments, you know, go much longer so you can have all your, your questions answered. And so it's really just, um, focusing on the patient's need and meeting them where they are. Makes a lot of sense. So uh, tell me what's on the future plans. What's the big initiatives you guys are working on for the next two to five years? So we're looking for other states to expand to states that, that we think we can make a difference in states where we, you know, our model works well. So we're always looking to expand to other states. We're also looking to expand other services. We have a, a very large a patient base that is open to the idea of alternative medicine. So we're looking for other ways to to service those patients and, and that need and use the physicians and the offices that we already have in place and expand the services, whether that's med spa services. Um, we have a, a CBD line that, that, is, that works very well, and we're looking to expand that. And we're looking to be a trusted source for our patients to come to to find uh, alternative medicines uh, that they can that they can trust 
and that are backed by science. I love that. So you're looking to really uh, grow additional services, maybe in the wellness space with nutrition, uh, supplements, and those types of products? Correct. Supplements, nutrition, there's there's a lot going on in, in, the, in, in the scientific world of individualized medicine. Yeah. And so as those become affordable and become, um, you know, science-based, we'll begin to offer those to our patients as well. And and we hope they'll have the confidence in us that, that, that our doctors will recommend to them products that will help them and that, that have some, you know, science behind them. That's terrific. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing some insights today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks so much for sharing insights today with us. I know our audience uh, will learn a lot from our conversation today. I'm sure there are a lot of providers that have thought about bringing medical marijuana to their patients and um, just haven't had the confidence, uh, didn't know where to start, um, or maybe their states just aren't there yet. But it seems like um, the trends are going toward you know, now is the time to start thinking about it if you haven't already, um, as far as partnering with Doc MJ or being able to make referrals to Doc MJ or other medical marijuana clinics in their area. Um, it's great to also hear that you do provide management and consulting services to other providers that want to get started. Yeah, happy to. I talk to doctors, you know, every week someone calls me and says, hey, what do you know about the legislation? Hey, what do you know about, you know, this new product? You know, this dispensary called me, what should I do? Um, so I get a lot of questions, both as, as the CEO of this company and as a regulatory attorney, <laughs> thinking, you know, am I going to get in trouble for doing this? Or what do you think about this? So happy to talk to anybody who, who's who's curious about the industry and, and about the practice of, of um, medical cannabis. Yeah, you're not only the business guy, but you're the, uh, the legal and um, regulatory guy. So you are a wealth of knowledge in this space. Well, it's a it's an ever changing ever changing um, landscape. So it, it's um, a challenge to keep up, but it's certainly exciting. And I love being in an industry where the ultimate goal is really to to relieve suffering from our patients and help them uh, enjoy a better and healthier life. That's amazing. I, I love the mission you guys are on. I think uh, this industry really needs to take their next big step in getting this care accessible to more and more patients and organizations like yours are uh, leading the charge. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Really, really enjoyed being here today. and appreciate your uh, including us um, um, in your company. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron, thanks again for your time. We will um, follow up with you in a few months and see if we can get you back on for another episode so we can learn everything uh, that's happening, the latest and greatest over at Doc MJ. I look forward to it. Thanks, Aaron. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too.